Hi, I'm Barry Ostrowski. At Barnabas Health, we believe citizens need to be informed about the important health care issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support health care programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners on public television. Funding for A Conversation with Governor Chris Christie and Steve Adubato has been provided by PSE&G, the law firm of Gibbons PC, TD Bank, NJ Best, United Water, Barnabas Health, Cone Resnick, Qualcare Inc., and by these public-spirited organizations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the issues that matter. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. And by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. You see, Italian you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Recently, I had the opportunity to sit down with New Jersey Governor Chris Christie for a compelling conversation where we discussed a range of issues facing New Jersey and the nation. Here's that conversation now. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of New York City. It's my honor, my pleasure to introduce the governor of the great state of New Jersey, Governor Chris Christie. You can tell that there is an audience here in New York at the Tisch WNET studio. Governor, I want to thank you for joining us. I got to ask you, I know there are pressing issues about Cuba. There are issues about uh, horrific situations involving our police and a whole range of other matters. But a whole range of folks on social media, NJ.com, Fios, and other places wanted to know, as I was watching, we're taping this show on the 22nd of uh, December. I happen to be a giant fan. Yeah. I know you are not. No. For the second week in a row, I saw you in the Jerry Jones Dallas Cowboy box. Yes, sir. You were in what I thought was an orange sweater. You assured me it was, excuse me, I read, you assured me it was orange. Mm -hmm. It was my TV, apparently. What is the deal with you and Dallas and Jerry Jones? Please clarify. Sure. Um, uh, ever since I've been nine years old, I was a Dallas Cowboys fan. Uh, starting back in Super Bowl V, I saw Roger Staubach play for the first time. I thought, this is a guy I want to root for, so I started rooting for the Cowboys. I've been a Cowboys fan ever since through really good years and through really bad years. And when I ran in 2009, I got asked about what my favorite football team was. I said it was the Dallas Cowboys. And uh, it was, is, and, and will be. You don't change your sports teams, you know? So um, that's who I am. And I've become friends with Jerry over the last five years. Jerry. Yeah, Jerry. I, 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 he allows me to call him Jerry. I don't call him Mr. Jones. Um, he calls me, I call him Jerry. And I've become friends with Jerry over the last five years. And um, you know, we were at the game together in Philadelphia two weeks ago. Sure. And then Mary Pat and myself and all the children went down to Dallas this weekend, and we went to the game yesterday. Want to move from sports? I don't care. Okay. It's your show. That won't last long. Um, <laughs> Governor, um, there is no easy transition to do this, but, but I want to talk about Cuba. And the Cuba, Cuban situation has become incredibly fascinating and controversial on a lot of levels. The president uh, clearly made a historic decision, an executive decision, many in Congress, including United States Senator Bob Menendez, who we just had on in a special with Cory Booker. Bob Menendez made his feelings clear about how he disagreed with the president regarding the Cuba situation and the agreement. But you went further and wrote a letter and basically said that the Cuban agreement reached by the United States is problematic largely because a woman by the name of Joanne Chesimard, um, who now goes by the name of Sada Shakur, in 1973 was convicted of killing a New Jersey state trooper, escaped to Cuba, has been in Cuba for a long period of time, as we believe. And you said what in that letter, as it relates to the agreement, in terms of her being extradited back to the United States for killing a state trooper? Well, in my mind, it's unacceptable to have uh, a reopening of diplomatic relations with Cuba and unacceptable 
to even consider taking them off the terrorist watch list uh, if they are harboring a convicted cop killer. And let's remember, that's what Joanne Chesimard is. She murdered in cold blood a New Jersey state trooper on the side of the road who was just doing his job. That family has lived with that pain and that loss now for 41 years. And for the last 30 years, this woman has been granted political asylum by the government of Cuba, been paid by the governor of Cuba, and she is a convicted cop killer. So what I said to the president was there should be no reopening of these relations and no um, uh, consideration taking them off the terrorist watch list because his own FBI, the president's own FBI, has her in the top 10 most wanted domestic terrorists. Uh, yet there's been no conversation that anyone's aware of regarding sending her back to complete her sentence. And remember, she used violence also, took prison guards hostage right. to escape in 1979. Governor, right before we came on the air, Sociedad Press put out a story from officials in Cuba who basically said, um, absolutely not. And I know you read it. Uh, basically, Sociedad Press reported that Josefina Vidal, representing the Cuban government, has said that um, every nation has sovereign and legitimate rights to grant political asylum to people it considers to have been persecuted. That's a legitimate right. They have said that there is no extradition agreement between the United States and Cuba, and they're wondering, who are you, Chris Christie, to be asking this? The president is not asking for it, so my question to you is this. What pressure will you be putting on the president to ask for Joanne Chesimar to be returned, and have you heard anything from the White House on this? Well, first off, I think it's very interesting the quote you used. She said that every sovereign nation has the right to grant asylum to people who have been persecuted. So Joanne Chesimard, a cold-blooded cop killer, convicted by a jury of her peers in what is, without question, the fairest and most just criminal justice system in the world, certainly much more just than anything that's happened in Cuba under the Castro brothers, she's now, according to a, an official of the Cuban government, Persecuted. Was the president wrong in not asking for this? The president was wrong in not asking for it, and the president is getting his proof right now through that comment. Remember, the president said this is going to change things in Cuba, this opening up. And another thing she said in that story that she didn't mention was that she said, we're happy to accept the entire package the president has offered. Well, what did the United States get? And more importantly, what did those people who are persecuted and whose human rights are violated in Cuba get? in return for America now opening up its economic and travel doors and full diplomatic relations with the power and the, and the majesty that that has to have an American embassy in your country. Was it a bad deal? It was an awful deal. And it is typical of this president, unfortunately, in negotiations. The Iranian nuclear deals extended six months at a time over and over and over again while they continue to move towards a nuclear capability. Now, we normalize relations with Cuba without getting anything in return. We have a hostage exchange, and that's what we get in return. Uh, we, for 50 years, have demanded that they have free elections, that they open the Internet, that they allow political prisoners to be released. None of those things mm -hmm. happen. We're just going to take that on the come, I guess. Um, listen, what I'm going to do is do what I need to do as governor of New Jersey, which is one of our state troopers was murdered in cold blood. His killer was convicted. And these thugs in Cuba have given her political asylum for 30 years. It's unacceptable, and I'm going to continue to speak out. I don't know whether I'll put any pressure on the president or not, but I'm certainly going to continue to speak out. Governor, unfortunately, there's a direct connection. We talk about that state trooper who was killed in 1973. We talk about the fact that right here in New York City, um, two of the bravest police officers killed sitting in their car, assassinated, if you will, right? As a former United States attorney, you've prosecuted cases involving police officers involved in these kinds of situations. Rudy Giuliani, who is very supportive of you, a former U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, former presidential candidate, has spoken out loudly on this. Rudy Giuliani has said <clears throat> that the mayor of New York City, Mayor de Blasio, as well as Al Sharpton, have created an environment that in many ways has contributed, they have contributed to 
open season on cops, and an environment where um, cops are now more vulnerable than ever before. Was he right? Well, I'll tell you this. One of the things that disturbs me about the entire conversation that we're having right now is that it seems like lots of people um, are trying to score political points here. And what I'm thinking about as we sit three days away from Christmas are those two families of those two police officers who will not have them at their dinner table at Christmas time, who won't have them there to open up the presents under the Christmas tree, who will not have them, not only just this Christmas, but every Christmas from now on going forward. And I think before we get into all of that analysis, it may be time for everybody in this region and around the country to take a deep breath and to think about the loss that's been suffered by these two families and take some time out to pray for them and for their families. And I, and I think the rest of it, there's plenty of time for us to discuss it, but I'm not going to be someone who's going to participate in this at the moment. I'd rather allow these police officers to be laid to rest, let these families grieve, and have all of us as a society think about what that means. Well, Governor, I'm going to try one more on this, and I totally respect and understand where you're coming from, but as a former prosecutor who understands this very well, and also as a governor who ran and got a very large percentage of the black and Latino vote to work very hard in black churches, in the black community, to gain trust. Here's my question. What do you believe needs to be done to try to strengthen what is clearly a strained and difficult and painful and unhealthy relationship between many in the black community and the police department? Well, Not I just in New York City, but in New Jersey as well. Sure, well listen. I think less talking and more doing of? of this. Let's look in Camden for a minute, Steve, um, where we have worked incredibly hard, the state and the county and the local government, to reestablish uh, law and order in Camden, but to do it in a way where the community feels empowered. And so if you look at what's happened in Camden over the last two years, murders are down 58 percent with the new police force that we put in effect, the county police force that has a metro division that covers Camden, 400 police officers on the street there. And just this week, you had Camden police officers dressed as Santa Claus mm. going door to door in some of the most underprivileged neighborhoods in Camden and giving out gifts that they had collected to those children and those underprivileged families. They want to make the community a part of the law enforcement community, and they want to build trust and respect between the citizens and themselves, and the citizens are participating in that and benefiting. And I think the model that we've established here in Camden could be a model that folks consider you around really the country. believe in Newark, where the federal government actually has taken over the police department, and in other places, you, and in New York City, because people care what you say nationally, Governor, you know that as well as I do. You believe the Camden model has the potential? I absolutely do. And listen, remember, Camden, for a number of years, was considered and ranked the most dangerous city yes. in America. So if it can work in Camden, yeah, I think it can okay. work anywhere. Okay. Um, Sony, I promise we'll do pension reform. We'll do uh, a whole bunch of other New Jersey stuff. Um, the president said that Sony capitulated and folded on the movie, the interview. All right? And they shouldn't have. Just can I get a yes or no? Did Sony fold unnecessarily? Yes. If Sony wanted to say, we're hanging in there, we're not going to let the North Koreans tell us what to do, First Amendment right, we're doing this, we're not going to, okay. Would you, as governor, if they wanted to show this in a New Jersey movie, let's say they're movie theaters, right? But we need protection because we have to protect the people who go, governor. Would you have said, you know what, we're going to back you up with state troopers, state police? Because they were afraid, obviously, for liability and for the safety of of people who would go, which makes sense. Certainly we would have worked with law enforcement, whether it was local, county, or state, or some combination of those, if there was a verified threat, which we would do now no matter what. If there's a verified threat in some other area of the state, we bring in the resources that are necessary to keep people safe, and this would be no different. The cyber thing is different, isn't it? You've seen it before. Well, yeah, but I no, I don't think it's different. You don't think it's different? No, listen, it's, it's another one of the evolving threats that we face in the world, unfortunately. We have to know the nature of our adversary, 
and we need to react accordingly. And I thought it was interesting to have the president say, well, Sony never called me. I, I don't know. You know, maybe it's just different ways of approaching a problem. But certainly we're briefed, mm. and he certainly was briefed about the attack. Yes. Um, it seems to me it's the obligation of the president of the United States to call them and say, okay, everybody in the White House, let's get together. Let's see how we're going to react to this. And, and then you can give those kind of assurances uh, regarding safety and security and the rest. And that the president has even more of an ability to provide than, than a governor. So I think there were a lot of mistakes here. I think Sony made a mistake by backing off. And I think, quite frankly, the president made a mistake by not being assertive. Yeah. And being getting everybody into the White House from Sony and the movie theater companies that Sony was complaining about and the intelligence community and say, OK, what's the nature of the threat? Explain the nature of the threat and what can we do to stop it? Is there a safe way to show this movie around the country um, without putting people's lives unnecessarily in danger? And, and that's what a leader does. NJ.com. You follow NJ.com. This is Star Ledger's website. And they had some wonderful questions. You ready for one? I see you are. Um, governor, pensions. Uh, the question on NJ.com was, Governor, when you ran, you talked about reforming the pension system, getting it right. A lot of fanfare having to do with the Democrats and Republicans coming together. Yeah. We actually interviewed uh, my colleague, Rafael P. Roman, who I have great respect for, uh, Capitol Report. We actually had Steve Sweeney, the president of the Senate. He said on our show, as it follows up this NJ.com question, he said we had a great deal with the governor to close the pension gap, to fund it, and Sweeney told Raphael and I on Capitol Report, the governor broke the promise. And he always thought you were a guy that would keep your promises. And he was shocked. Please explain. Now, listen, I, the fact is that unless Steve um, comes up with a way to print money. You um, mean the, the Senate president? Well, I call him Steve. OK. Um, uh, unless Steve comes up with a way to print money. He knows full well, nor did the Democrats ever come forward with a plan that would have fully made the pension payment. And so, you know... There Explain are, to folks the whole thing. Like, Well, listen, the fact of the matter is, the pension today... Of public employees. Of public employees, teachers, police officers, firefighters, other government workers... It's broke. No. First of all, there are $70 billion in assets on deposit today. Mm. $70 billion in assets, with a B to pay these pensions. This pension system is in much better shape today because of the deal that we made in 2011. The much better shape. Bipartisan compromise. Right, that we made in 2011 that would have been if we had not made it. And yes, we were not able to make the full payment that we hoped to make in this most recent budget year, the one we're in right now. Um, but it's simply because we didn't have the money. And there was no plan that was put forward that could be put forward uh, that was going to come up with the money to do it. And so we paid all of the payment that needed to be made for that year. What we didn't pay was the money that hadn't been paid by all the previous governors. With all that being said, we've paid in my administration, in five budgets, $2.9 billion into the pension program, which is more than any governor has put in in history. And so, listen, Steve um, has to play politics at times. I understand that. So you don't um, think he actually believes that you broke a promise? No, he understands the fact that we, we, because by the way, this budget that I passed without the full pension payment in it was passed by the state legislature. By the Democrats? Yes, and sent to my desk. But he did say uh, at a business and industry association forum, I happened to moderate with the legislative leaders last week, he said publicly again that he said one of the ways to fund the pension, if you were willing to support it, was an increase in the millionaire's tax. Right. Which, and if you supported an increase in the millionaire's tax, meaning those who earn a million dollars or more, Governor, that, I don't know, is it $600 million would come in of additional revenue, and that money could go directly into funding the pension? And he said that would go a long way, but the governor says no. No. Well, first off, because unfortunately, um, Steve and many Democrats like him um, have never met a tax that they don't like to increase. And the fact is that folks who make a lot of money in this state pay more in taxes than all people at that level, with the exception of one of two other states uh, in the country. And as a result, New Jersey continues to have challenges with those folks moving out of our state and taking with them the jobs and the small businesses that they create. Everybody doesn't mind taxes being raised on other people. 
They don't like the rates on them. Mm. Um, fact is, what we've done in the last five years is to hold taxes steady in this state. Uh, and I'm going to continue to make sure that we do that. And the fact is that a, the person who earns the median income here in New Jersey, the median income, the middle class, pays lower taxes on their income than any other state in the country. And so I'm trying to make sure that we continue to protect that kind of distinction. And I'm not going to, you know, go for higher income taxes. No and way. by the way, no, no way. And by the way, the $600 million that they're talking about raising, which is, by the way, optimistic, but let's just give them the $600 million, still would only pay half of... A half of but it would help. Other. Yeah. Well, you know what? And the hurt that it would do on the other side of the equation to the state's economy would do much more damage to the people of this state. There are ways we can get this fixed. We should continue to work on getting it mm. fixed together. I continue to look forward to working with them on getting it fixed. But, you know, that kind of stuff at those kind of forums uh, that Steve participates in, you know, sometimes folks, all folks in politics, play to the audience. Um, it's my job to make sure that I tell people the truth. Um, real quick on this. Uh, revenue projections. You know, you talk to the folks in the legislature, they have their folks who say, this is how much money's coming in, how much revenue's coming in. You have your folks on the Treasury side saying, this is how much money coming, is coming in. They're never the same numbers. But you have to propose a budget based on the numbers that are certified and you believe are the numbers. Right. Does it matter to you, Governor, that the the bond houses, the folks who are looking at this stuff, have downgraded our credit several times because they're arguing that they're questioning the stability of the state budget. Does that no. bother you at all? No, because these are the same people who got us into the financial mess in 2008 and 2009 by not telling people the truth, and now they're trying to make it up for it. So that's one problem. So I don't think they have a whole lot of credibility. And I think their track record and all the people who have sued them prove that they don't have a lot of credibility. But secondly, um, we also have a situation where the credit problems that they're talking about have been stuff that's been developed over 15 years in the state, that we're the ones who are taking the course towards fixing. For instance, our budget in fiscal year 2015 spends less money in actual dollars than we spent in fiscal year 2008, seven years ago. Now, that kind of fiscal discipline hasn't been seen in New Jersey in a long time. Through what? Cutting? Yeah, and main cutting, maintaining, reducing the number of state employees that we have, getting rid of unnecessary programs. We've done all those things and been criticized for many of them by Democratic members of the legislature who all want to have their cake and eat it too. Can't do that. And so we won't do it. And uh, we're not going to. So the credit downgrade stuff is inside baseball and nothing that I'm concerned about uh, at Real all. quick, because we're going to take a quick break just because we're breaking this up into two and a half hours. Um, give me two minutes on Atlantic City, and I know you're disappointed in the results there because I've heard you say it before, because you really wanted to see a renaissance there and uh, with the Revel situation and everything else. You're not happy with that. Well, I think we, I, no. Well, of course, I'm never happy when anybody loses their job. And what matters to me the most is not the number of casinos or all the rest of that. What matters to me is that every casino that closes, people lose their job. Is it four right now, or is it? Listen, what's going to happen over the course of time? Uh, is there were 13 casinos in Atlantic City in a very small... Too many? Well, of course, because they were built during a period of time when we had a monopoly on casino gaming east of the Mississippi. There are now 40 states that offer casino gaming. Well, by the very nature of competition, a city that's built on a monopoly and doesn't change, when the monopoly is broken, will no longer be viable. So I think we'll get down to a smaller number of casinos. I'm not going to predict how many. But I think it's a natural right-sizing of the city in terms of gaming. What we've been trying to do over the last few years and had real success at is increasing the non-gaming revenue, which has gone up every year since we put our plan into effect. And we got a lot more work to do. But in the meantime, while that right-sizing goes on, um, it is going to be painful. Uh, and we have to understand that. But one last thing. The casino gaming revenue in 2013 in Atlantic City was $2.5 billion dollars. Now, that is down from six years ago at a high of $5.2 billion. But at $2.5 billion, it is the second highest gaming revenue state in America behind Nevada. Wouldn't sports betting make it even better? Well, it would, and that's why I fought for sports gaming, continue to fight in court to get sports gaming uh, win legalized. It? I don't know whether we're going to win or not. I hope we're going to win. I'm confident that we're right. And you had the commissioner of the NBA today calling on me to join him to legalize gaming it. across the nation. Well, then... Mr. Commissioner, withdraw your lawsuit and let's start 
by legalizing it in New Jersey. And if other states want to legalize it, we're happy to compete. But I think it's kind of crazy for the commissioner of the NBA to say, uh, through one, on one hand, uh, join me, governor, and let's have legalized sports gaming everywhere, but not in New Jersey right now. You think it's inconsistent and hypocritical? Well, I, I don't. I, you put words in my mouth. I think. Well, you put. What, what, no, what do you I, call did, it? I did not use the word hypocritical well, or you inconsistent. What, call it. what I would call it, quite frankly, is a bait and switch. Um, you're, you're, you come over here and work with me on the federal government side to try to get something passed through Congress. That's been really successful lately. Get something passed through Congress, but in the meantime, you wait. And we're going to go to the courts to stop and we're going to continue to have our injunction courts. against you. Yes. So if Adam Silver believes that sports gaming is okay, then allow sports gaming in New Jersey, allow mm -hmm. us to be the model like we were with Nevada on casino gaming, and then yeah. as other states want to join in, New Jersey will not object to other states coming first, in. first, though. Well, I'd like to be next. Okay, one more quickie on this before we go to the break. Uh, some of our the folks that we know want to have a casino, legalized gambling in northern New Jersey, and you say... We'll see. Come on, you never hold back on these things. Sports. I hold back all the time if I don't have the answer. What would be wrong I don't, with listen, that? I don't, I don't answer questions just because you ask them. Huh? If I don't have an answer, I'm not giving you one. The answer is we'll see. But you're, you're, that would be a great idea for those up in the Meadowlands area. It would do good things for them, a lot of folks say. The county executive in Essex County... Joe DiVincenzo says it would be great for the economy up there. Some Bergen County legislators say it would be great for the economy. You say? We'll see. That's all the time we have. So join us next time for this very special edition of One on One, a conversation with New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation and NJTV in cooperation with 13 for WNET, WHYY. Fios One News, 77 WABC AM New York, and by WBGO Jazz 88.3 FM. Funding for A Conversation with Governor Chris Christie and Steve Adubato has been provided by PSENG, the law firm of Gibbons PC, TD Bank, NJ Best, United Water, Barnabas Health, Cone Resnick, Qualcare Inc., and by these public-spirited organizations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the issues that matter. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. New Jersey is a leader in solar power, and PSE&G is doing its part. With 24 solar installations in New Jersey, Projects that are giving landfills new purpose and turning former brownfields green. Solar powers more than our homes and schools and businesses. It powers our economy by creating jobs right here in the Garden State. PSE&G, proud to support New Jersey.